Sohas. He uh, received his bachelor's degree uh, from, uh, in mechanical engineering from the National Institute of Technology in uh, Karnataka in India. Uh, after graduation, he went to, to Germany for an internship in the uh, Helmholtz, in the Institute of Fluid Dynamics in, uh, uh, at the Helmholtz Zentrum Dresden. He has already published seven uh, journal articles in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics, uh, Physical Review of Fluids, Atomization and Sprays, Journal of Computational Physics, and uh, International Journal of uh, Multiphase Flows. Uh, he also has six journal articles that he's working on right now that are in, in preparation. Um, the topic his uh, thesis is a novel diffuse interface model and numerical methods for the simulation of compressible turbulent two phase flows and scalar transforms. The meeting committee and the examination committee are uh, uh, Ali Mani, Professor Mani, uh, Professor Dunham from Geophysics is uh, chairing the committee, and Professor Lele. So without further ado, uh, also <coughs> welcome uh, Sohas's uh, spouse that's sitting uh, there right now. And also his parents, I think, are uh, connected from, from India. So, Thank you, Professor Moin, for the introduction. I think that, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thanks everyone for coming to this uh, open portion of the exam. Uh, focus of my today's talk is on the development of numerical methods and uh, novel diffuse interface model for the simulation of compressible two-phase flows and also scalar transport. This uh, talk has two parts to it. One is uh, on the compressible two-phase flows in turbulent regime and also modeling scalar transport in two-phase flows. I'd like to thank the funding support from the fellowship and also ONR. Compressible two-phase flows has a wide range of applications, both in natural and engineering processes. Uh, one application is acoustic detection of ship and submarine wakes. It is known that the wakes of these uh, submarines extend for hundreds of uh, meters downstream, and these wakes can be detected from underwater using acoustic techniques. Uh, this inevitably reveals the location of uh, the ship or submarine, and therefore this is uh, a problem of interest for Navy. Another application is the sound suppression system. Here we are seeing a video from NASA Kennedy Space Center. They eject large quantities of water uh, over 450,000 gallons uh, per minute to suppress uh, the noise to, and to keep it below 150 decibels and to dissipate the high energy, uh, high acoustic energy to avoid any damage to the payload and also uh, the shuttle. This is just a video from the, uh, from the test. But uh, here is the actual video from the liftoff, where uh, we can see the ejection of the water. I couldn't find a better video than this, but yeah. Another application is the boiling water nuclear reactor. It's, it's also important to uh, accurately model uh, boiling phenomenon. 
which is also a compressible two-phase flow uh, for the efficient design of this uh, nuclear reactor. More applications include re modeling Rayleigh-Taylor instability for inertial confinement fusion applications and modeling Rickmeyer-Mishkov instability that is seen in supernova and galactic flows, uh, modeling atomization uh, for combustor, efficient combustor design, and also modeling bubble cavitation that are important for uh, a design of propeller and also in various medical applications such as lithotripsy. So modeling two-phase flows is challenging. Some of the challenges include uh, discrete conservation of mass, total momentum, and kinetic energy. And particularly, kinetic energy is important for accurate modeling of uh, turbulent flows. Here I'm showing a simple picture of drop deforming in a shearing flow. In such a simple flow, we can see that drop has lost almost 80% of its mass in going from here to here, which is not acceptable in a, uh, in a real simulation. More challenges include handling discontinuity in density across the interface and handling dynamic creation of uh, interfaces and also complex topological changes. Here we can see uh, an image of uh, atomization of a liquid jet in air cross flow. Due to the high speed liquid air cross flow, we can see uh, the complex corrugations that are generated on the liquid surface uh, and also the generation of thousands of droplets um, downstream. This, this shows the complex nature of uh, such an atomization. Uh, of, uh, of such a simulation. We also have challenges in handling large separation of scales. Here we can see the video of a turbulent breakup. Uh, these breaking waves can be on the order of uh, meter scale, but it is known that when these waves break, uh, the bubbles that are generated underwater can be on the order of micrometer scale. Uh, such large separation of scales makes this problem challenging. And the, the method should maintain robustness in high Reynolds number turbulent flows such as uh, for example, a bubble column here, uh, where the bubbles are uh, uh, rising due to buoyancy in, in a turbulent channel flow. Another challenge is uh, accurate modeling of surface tension effects. Uh, here, uh, this is just a simple uh, simulation of a droplet uh, advecting in a qua uh, advecting simple advection of a droplet. It is known that including surface tension effects uh, while modeling introduces these artificial velocity fields around the interface and these velocity fields can be so large that they could deform, artificially deform and break up the drop. In addition to those six challenges that I showed, when we go to compressible regime, we have more challenges. For example, maintaining thermodynamic consistency at the interface, we need, uh, this is required to avoid any spurious pressure oscillations at the interface. And we also need uh, conservation of total energy and possibly also en entropy conservation in the absence of dissipative mechanisms. The method should, uh, we should be able to uh, also accurately model a shock inter interface interaction in compressible regime. Owing to these uh, challenges, the research on two-phase flows has been uh, underway for more than 70 years for now. And because of this, we have a lot of methods for modeling of two-phase flow, two flows. Uh, broadly, we can classify the two-phase flows as particle-based methods, lattice Boltzmann method and smooth particle hydrodynamics, and Eulerian methods that are one fluid and two fluid models. In the one, so in this work we use the one, uh, we choose one fluid model because it solves one set of equations for both phases, uh, as opposed to a two fluid model, where two set of equations uh, are solved. Uh, this one fluid model can be further classified uh, into interface tracking methods and interface capturing methods. The idea behind interface tracking method is that you add particles at the interface and you advect these particles in time and then reconstruct the interface after each time step. And the idea behind interface capturing method is that you implicitly capture the interface uh, using uh, the field quantities such as volume fraction or level set of fields. Here we choose interface capturing method because of its simplicity. And this interface capturing method can be further classified into volume of fluid, level set method, and also diffuse interface methods. Diffuse interface methods are known to be less expensive compared to a geometric volume of fluid method, and is also known to be uh, superior in terms of conservation of mass compared to a level set method. Um, therefore, we choose diffuse interface method uh, in this study. But other than that, volume of fluid is known to be the state of the art method for in incompressible flows because of its high accuracy. But when it comes to compressible regime, uh, this um, advantage of having high accuracy in maintaining or in conserving the volume is, is, is not that useful because volume is not conserved in a compressible flow. Therefore, we choose a diffuse interface method in this work. 
So the rest of the talk is divided into four subsections. First, we look at the development of the model and verification. Next, uh, we, compare, uh, we compare the model with the existing methods in the literature. And then we look at the numerical stability of the model for high Reynolds number turbulent flows. And also on the, and finally, we look at the modeling of transport of scalars in two phase flows. Let's jump right into the first section of model development and verification. So if you look at the continuum picture of the interface between fluid, say fluid one and fluid two on the left, the actual thickness of this physical interface is on the order of nanometers. And, and for most practical purposes of continuum modeling, this can be considered sharp. Uh, this poses a, a problem in modeling two-phase flows, especially on, uh, if, if you're trying to model using Eulerian methods due to the discontinuities that are, uh, and jumps in the field quantities that are uh, seen at the interface. Uh, the idea behind the diffuse interface method is to artificially represent this physical interface as a diffused region uh, that is spread across a couple of grid points, as you can see here. And with this approach, now we can resolve all the, uh, all the jumps such in density and other quantities on an Eulerian grid. So we start with the baseline five equation model. Uh, this was developed by Alair and, and, and Kapila in 2000s. The first equation is the volume fraction equation. The second and the third equations are the species mass equation. And the fourth one is the momentum. And the last equation is the total energy transport equation. Uh, it is known that uh, for term to maintain thermodynamic consistency with this baseline five equation model, we need to satisfy this condition called as interface equilibrium condition. Uh, this can be stated as if, if the velocity and pressure are uniform at time step n, then, uh, it, and then they have to remain uniform uh, for say time step n plus one and all further, uh, all, all future time steps. And uh, Alair who developed the baseline five equation model that I showed in the previous slide, they came up with this isobaric closure law and they showed that this is a sufficient or this is required to satisfy this interface equilibrium condition with the five equation model. Now we, using this isobaric closure law and assuming uh, two different equation of states for uh, two phases, uh, so say phase one and phase two, they, we, then we can uh, arrive at this general mixture equation of state. Here alpha and beta are the material properties uh, of the two phases. Some of the limitations of uh, the use of uh, baseline five equation model is that this model cannot be directly coupled with a dissipative, um, uh, non-dissipative scheme. And if we couple it with a non-dissipative scheme, then it results in undershoots and overshoots. And therefore, this has to be coupled with a dissipative scheme. And when we couple it with a dissipative, dissipative scheme, uh, we, we see that the interface diffuses over time, and this results in poor accuracy. We can see an example simulation here of a shock interacting with a helium bubble uh, in air. The solid lines represent the isocontours of the volume fraction, and the spacing between the lines represent the thickness of the interface. And as time progresses, we can see that the interface thickness is increasing, which results in poor accuracy. So to overcome this issue, uh, Shukla in 2010, they proposed this uh, quasi-conservative model. Idea behind this is to add this diffusion and sharpening fluxes together. They are called as regularization fluxes uh, in such a way that the balance of this uh, fluxes results in an equilibrium interface shape that is uh, of the or that is of the form hyperbo uh, hyperbolic tangent function, as we can see here, with the thickness of the interface epsilon. Uh, the idea behind this is to uh, is that if if the interface is initially very sharp or if the interface is initially very diffuse. For example, the red lines that we see here, then the effect of inclusion of this regularization term is that uh, it forces the interface to take this uh, uh, tangent hyperbolic or hyperbolic tangent function with epsilon as the thickness of the interface. But one thing that we need to note here is that this model that they proposed was not in a conservative form. Therefore, our objective is to develop a model that is conservative and it has to be consistent with and it has to be consistently coupled with other equations and the model has to be accurate. It should be uh, cost effective, easy to implement, because uh, and because it's a PDE, we can see that it's already easy to implement. The model has to scale well, and it has to be non-dissipative for uh, accurate modeling of turbulent flows. And the model should maintain constant interface thickness throughout the simulation. And the model should also be robust in handling large discontinuities and uh, at higher Reynolds numbers. 
So with these objectives, we, we propose this uh, model form. Uh, the right hand side, uh, we can see that the, the new model form is, is, in the, is in conservative form and it also has the same uh, diffusion and sharpening fluxes. And because of which the, the equilibrium solution uh, is also a tangent hyper hyperbolic tangent function. Now let's, with this new model form, now let's go back and look at other equations and see if they are consistent with this correction that we proposed for the volume fraction. The correction is, this, is, 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 is highlighted here in green. So let's go and look at the species mass equation uh, in the baseline five equation model. We can check some of the consistency conditions, such as in the limit of incompressible flows, we can see that this mass, species mass equation reduces to this volume fraction equation, but this is not the equation that we are transporting. Uh, and away from the interface, this reduces to the continuity equation, and therefore this satisfies the second consistency condition. To, uh, because it doesn't satisfy the consistency uh, first consistency condition, we come up with a correction to the species mass equation that is of this form. You can see that the correction that we proposed is, uh, is in conservative form. And now in the limit of incompressible flows, this reduces to the volume fraction equation that we are transporting with the correct right hand side. And and also in away from the interface, this again reduces to the continuity equation. Therefore, it satisfies both consistency conditions. Now let's look at momentum equation um, in the baseline five equation model. If we take a dot product of the velocity with the momentum equation, then we can arrive at the kinetic energy transport equation. But we can see that the interface regularization term in the kinetic energy equation is not in a conservative form. Therefore, this spuriously contributes to the total kinetic energy of the system. To fix this issue, we propose this correction to the, con uh, to the momentum equation and call it consistent momentum equation. You can see that the proposed correction is in conservative form. And when we follow the same steps again and derive the kinetic energy equation, you can see that the, uh, the regularization term is in conservative uh, form. And it, therefore, it does not seriously contribute to the total kinetic energy of the system. So now that we have kinetic energy, let's look at internal energy. To derive internal energy equation, we, we start with entropy. Entropy is not exactly conserved in a diffuse interface method because of the additional interface regularization terms that we have introduced, which is, a re, which is an irreversible process. For the sake of curiosity, we can assume that entropy is approximate or exactly conserved, and then use Gibbs relation, and we can derive this form of internal energy equation that results in exact entropy conservation. But we can see that the interface regularization terms in, the, in this internal energy equation spuriously contributes to the internal, total internal energy of the system. Um, and we also found that this violates the interface equilibrium condition that I showed earlier. This again verifies that the entropy cannot be exactly conserved in a, in, in a, with a diffuse interface method. Therefore, we now seek approximate conservation of entropy. And then we arrive at this uh, model form for the internal energy equation that has no spurious contribution. Uh, now the regularization term has no spurious contribution. And also, we found that this satisfies the interface equilibrium condition that I showed earlier. If I now represent this regularization diffusion and sharpening reg, uh, flux as A for the sake of brevity, then I can sum up the kinetic energy equation and en internal energy equation to arrive at the total energy equation that is shown below. Uh, as we can see, all the terms are in conservative form, and therefore, the total energy in the system is conserved. Now, I'm just, uh, if, we, if I um, put all the equations back, uh, we can see that the, uh, all the consistent uh, terms uh, and the correction to the equations that we introduced are highlighted here. Um, we also introduced uh, additional uh, effect, uh, terms such as vi viscous effects, uh, surface tension, and, and gravity terms. And this five equation model is closed uh, uh, with the use of a general uh, mixture equation of state. For the sake of implementation, uh, as part of my uh, PhD thesis, I developed a solver called CTR3D. Uh, three, uh, three and this is written in uh, C++, and it uses MPI for parallelization. And we use second order uh, central uh, scheme for space, and also uh, fourth order RK uh, scheme in time. We have optimized the solver for parallel performance on, on, on Mira and Theta supercomputers. And we can see that it, the solver scales well uh, up to 400,000 CPU cores. So now let's look at, look, at the, look at some of the verification test cases. The first one is a drop in a shear flow. In this, the idea behind this test case is that you impose a, a shearing velocity field 
uh, and after some time you reverse the flow such that uh, and due to the shearing, velo uh, shearing velocity field droplet uh, undergoes deformation and after some time you reverse the flow with the hope that you recover the final shape of the drop. Here we can see the video of that. The classic test case, uh, this is a classic test case and it only contained solenoidal velocity field and it was used to verify incompressible uh, methods, incompressible interface capturing methods before. We have modified this test case to include this dilatational contribution because we can handle compressible effects. And now we can see that the drop is not only undergoing deformation, but it is also undergoing compression. And when we reverse the flow, it, uh, it expands back and we recover this, the initial volume and also initial shape of the drop. Here is some of the uh, um, snapshots of the drop shape at final time and also at half time. As we increase the grid size, we can, uh, we can see that we recover the the initial circular shape of the drop, and this is the volume drop volume. We can see that it, it undergoes compression, and, it, we and at final time, we recover the uh, initial drop volume. Here, I have listed the volume error of the drop. Volume error is just the difference between the final and initial volumes. And as you can see, we quickly recover, uh, we reach machine precision in the volume error. And shape error is defined uh, as follows here, which is just the difference between the volume fractions and at initial time and final time. And we can see that it is converging at a, uh, between first and second order, but close to second order. This is uh, next, we are, let's look at the oscillating drop test case. Here we are uh, verifying the implementation of surface tension. We start with a water droplet in air. Initially, the, uh, the water droplet is elliptical in shape with half radii A and B. And uh, the Laplace number in this test case is quite high on the order of 10 power 9. And therefore, the viscous effects can be considered negligible. But due to the effect, uh, due to the presence of surface tension, this drop undergoes oscillation, and which is also due to the balance of inertia, inertia and surface tension. Uh, and we can see the uh, oscillating drop here on the left. And this oscillation continues until all the energy is uh, dissipated due to viscous effects. Here we can see some of the uh, some some results by the recent work. Uh, uh, fr yeah, from the recent work. Uh, by Garrick, and they use three different grid resolutions, 100, 200, and 400 square for uh, the simulation. And we can see that due to the numerical dissipation that they added to stabilize the flow, they don't recover uh, the kinetic energy that we, or the, the total uh, energy line that we are supposed to recover in this. And we are supposed to recover this total energy line that is uh, the sum of kinetic energy and surface energy because the viscous effects are small in, in this case. And if we look at our results, uh, we can see that all three, we, and we simulated uh, and used the same grid resolution, and we see that all three results recover very well, recover the total energy line. Next, we look at uh, a simple acoustic interface interaction test case. If you have an acoustic wave incident on a flat interface, then we'll have a reflected wave and a transmitted wave. And the amplitudes of these uh, reflected and transmitted waves can be calculated using this reflection coefficient and transmission coefficient here, Z1 and Z2 are the acoustic imp impedances for the mediums, two mediums. Here we consider water and air. The length scale is 10 micrometer. For, for water and air, we, uh, we can calculate that the reflection coefficients are, uh, reflection coefficient is uh, approximately negative one, and the transmission coefficient is 10 power minus three, which is, is quite small. Therefore, every, every time wave is uh, incident on the interface, uh, we, we see that the wave flips. And nothing gets transmitted across the interface because the transmission coefficient is quite small. Finally, for the sake of validation, we look at a three-dimensional uh, really taylor instability uh, 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 simulation at Atwood numbers 0.15 and Reynolds number of 1,000. Here we can see the time evolution of the interface between the light and dense fluids. Uh, light and dense fluids interpenetrate into each other due to the gravity effects, and and the light fluid is generally called as a bubble in the art, in the Rayleigh-Taylor uh, instability literature, and and the heavier fluid is usually called a spike. Here on the left, uh, we have plotted the velocity of the bubble and and the velocity of the spike uh, um, with respect to the height and the height of the bubble and height of the spike, and we have compared the simulation results with the experimental results. The dots uh, or the symbols that we see are from the experimental results, that, which, verif which validates our which have, uh, method and the solver. 
let's go uh, next let's go to the comparison uh, quantitative comparison uh, section the three methods that we want to compare are the conservative model that we developed uh, and the quasi conservative model by shukla that all that i showed earlier uh, the difference is that we can see that this um, the regularization term is not in a conservative form here and the third method that we are comparing against is the localized artificial diffusivity idea behind this LAD method is to add these uh, diffusion terms on the right hand side of the equations uh, and these are localized around the interface and there are no sharpening terms um, in this method and all methods are consistently coupled with other uh, equations in the system and the three quantities that we are looking at are uh, the ability of the method to maintain interface shape uh, conservation property and also uh, the ability to maintain constant interface thickness throughout the simulation and all the three methods were implemented in the Pardee op solver uh, for the sake of fair comparison and also it was coupled with artificial bulk shear viscosity for shock capturing let's look at a simple uh, simulation of a bubble advection here we have 50 grid points across the diameter of the bubble and we advected for and we we start with an initial uh, uniform velocity and we are and the bubble advects for a long time and this is the final uh, state of the bubble that we see due to the lack of sharpening terms we see some uh, amount of uh, di uh, diffusion in the led case and and we also observed that a small there's a small amount of interface distortion with the conservative model but if you look at quasi conservative model it looks very good at this point which was puzzling because we wanted to develop a model that was better than quasi conservative model so now let's look at the same test case but at a coarse resolution now we have five grid points across the diameter of the bubble which is a more practical test case because if you're interested in simulating this atomization we can't afford to have 50 grid points across these small bub droplets that are generated in atomization uh, so yeah, we, we again repeat the same test case uh, and advect this bubble for a long time and we found that the bubble is completely lost with the quasi-conservative model which is not acceptable. Next we look at a shock interaction with a helium bubble in air test case here. Uh, uh, here we are come uh, from left to right is the time evolution of the bubble shape. With the LAD method due to the lack of sharpening we see that the interface diffuses with time little bit and with the quasi conservative model we found that the lig ligament at the onset of breakup was completely missing and here are some experimental snapshots from uh, for this test case and with the with our conservative model we, we found that there was some grid induced breakup but without any subgrid model for breakup there is no hope to capture uh, the breakup physics so these are some quantitative results for the same test case on the left is the mass of the bubble with the three methods the red line is the quasi conservative model we can see that the uh, the error in the mass was highest at the onset of breakup when the ligament was missing and the other two methods uh, uh, conserve the mass on the right is the the thickness of the interface and with the LED method uh, there is some increase in the um, interface thickness due to the lack of sharpening terms compared to the other methods if I now uh, want to summarize this we found that the quasi conservative model was not conservative but the other two models are and with the sharp or and for the sake of sharp interface uh, we found that the LED uh, results in some artificial diffusion whereas the other two methods uh, fairly maintain the constant interface thickness and we found that there was uh, some artificial distortion of the interface uh, with the conservative with our conservative model uh, but other um, models may fairly maintain the accurate interface shape for a long time so to, uh, to overcome this issue or to fix this issue we revised the model and we developed uh, this model called as accurate model we can, com we can see the difference here the, here we have introduced a new variable called psi which is a sign distance function let's quickly go back and see the uh, results of this model with the same bubble advection test case here we can see that with the new model uh, the artificial uh, distortion of the interface is significantly reduced and if I go back and look at uh, this table again we can see that uh, this model will all not will preserve shape for a long time and also has other two advantages and therefore it uh, satisfies these and in addition to these the, it, this model also results in better normal computation and curvature and improved surface tension and also sharper results in sharper and more accurate interface representation 
let's uh, look at the, uh, the next section is on higher uh, Reynolds number flows in shock free compressible regime and also the numerical stability of the uh, method for high Reynolds number flows. It is known that the discrete conservation of kinetic energy improves the numerical stability of, uh, uh, of the methods. Uh, the I, so, if we take a dot product of the velocity with the discrete momentum equation, we can derive a discrete kinetic energy equation. Uh, the idea behind uh, development of this keep or kinetic energy preserving scheme, kept or kinetic energy preserving scheme is to seek those discrete forms of the terms in the momentum equation that does not result in any spurious contribution to the kinetic energy equation. And it was shown that this is a sufficient condition for numerical stability for incompressible flows. So let's use this uh, KEP scheme or KEP uh, to for, for the simulation of single phase compressible flow. So here we, we start with a, a Taylor Green vortex uh, at infinite Reynolds number and on coarse grid. Uh, coarse grid because it's a good test of robustness. Um, here I'm showing the evolution of kinetic energy and the change in entropy. We, we can see that the, the kinetic energy preserving scheme quickly diverges. Uh, and therefore, this is not a sufficient condition for numerical stability for compressible flows. So what we need is uh, the conservation of entropy for nonlinear stability for compressible flows. And there are various approaches to, uh, to make a method uh, entropy preserving. One such approach would be to directly solve an entropy equation instead of uh, energy equation. And another approach would be to modify an ener uh, the energy equation such that we can conserve entropy and also higher moments of entropy. And these methods were explored in this work. So here we instead seek implicit conservation of approximate entropy because this, uh, this approach does not require any modification to the underlying system of PDEs. Here the idea is that we can uh, arrive at the entropy transport equation starting from the total energy equation using Gibbs, Gibbs relation. So we seek discrete forms of the terms in the total energy equation that does not result in any spurious contribution to the entropy equation. So with this uh, idea, we, we have derived uh, kinetic, en uh, kinetic energy and internal energy fluxes, uh, discretely consistent fluxes that result in kinetic energy and entropy preserving scheme. And more importantly, I want to highlight that the internal energy flux that we derived uh, uh, is, is crucial and, it, satis and it, it is derived in such a way that it satisfies the interface equilibrium condition, which is uh, crucial for two phase flows and other methods uh, in the literature, they fail to satisfy this condition. So next, now let's go back and look at the same Taylor Green vortex case. Now instead of uh, single phase, we have two phase uh, where we have a fluid uh, of slab of fluid one inside fluid two, surrounded by fluid two, and it's a triply periodic uh, domain again. Here uh, I'm plotting the evolution of kinetic energy, change in entropy of fluid one and change in entropy of fluid two. We can see that our method, uh, the, our method is 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 the is represented by these uh, triangle symbols. We can see that our method, because it satisfies both interface equilibrium condition it, uh, and other discrete consistency conditions, it, satis uh, it results in preserving kinetic energy and entropy, whereas other methods in the literature, they fail to satisfy those uh, conditions and therefore they diverge quickly. Here are some snapshots from this simulation. The green surface is the interface between fluid one and fluid two. Um, as, we can, as the vortex breaks down, we can see that the fluid slab also breaks down and, and it sort of reaches a uh, stationary state at the end, at the final time. We shouldn't look too much into that test case because that was only a test of robustness. And here, this is a more resolved uh, test case where we have finite Reynolds number. We start with initial Reynolds number 75 and we start with 1,000 uniformly spaced 1,000 droplets uh, with vapor number of 1 and we increase the density ratio. So this is the initial uh, state of the system and we increase the density ratio. That is we increase the density of the droplets from one all the way up to 1000 and see the evolution. And we found that uh, for the lower density ratio cases, the droplet size increase with time. And we have also looked, so this is again a test, another test of robustness, but we have also looked at say evolution of kinetic energy and, and uh, looked at the effect of these uh, droplets and the density ratio on the evolution of kinetic energy. But not going to show the, that result today. So let's go to the final section um, on uh, scalar transport modeling for two-phase flows. 
So uh, the scalar transport model in, into FESPOS has wide range of applications. For example, electrochemical system. Uh, here we can see that uh, bubbles are generated uh, at the electrode uh, during a reaction, and this, these bubbles are surrounded by ionic species. And this is, uh, this is an important application that uh, is, uh, is a good classic example of the scalar transport into phase flow. Another uh, uh, or more, uh, more applications include scalar trans uh, surfactant transport and dissolved salts. It is known that the surfactant trans uh, surf presence of surfactants and salts in oceans inhibit collisions, and that is the reason for the formation of foam in ocean. So it is important to study these, uh, these uh, phenomena. And another application is, is thermal transport in a two-phase microchannel. So this is a classic setup uh, in any thermal hydraulic system. And here, temperature is, is the scalar that we want to study. So the common thing uh, in all of these applications uh, is that the scalars typically have very different diffusivities in two phases. For example, carbon dioxide mass diffusivity is on the order of 10 power minus 5 yeah. in air, and it's on the order of 10 power minus 9 in water. It's 10,000 times smaller than in air. Thermal diffusivity is on the order of 10 power minus 5 in air and 10 power minus 7 in water, which is 100 times smaller than in air. Therefore, scalar will be confined to the air medium um, in this case for most practical uh, time scales of interest. And in, and in the worst case scenario, we could, we could even have a system where the diffusivity ratio goes to infinity. Um, so we want to study this worst case scenario here. So let's look at the setup here. So we have two phases, phase one and phase two. The scalar has a finite diffusivity in phase one and a zero diffusivity in phase two. And because of this uh, infinite diffusivity ratio, scalar is now confined only to phase one. And because of this confinement, we have uh, a sharp jumps in the scalar concentration field at, at the interface. And this is uh, uh, numerically a challenging to problem uh, to resolve this jump on an Eulerian grid. So let's look at why this is challenging. If we start with a simple equation, transport equation, a convection diffusion equation for scalar, one way to model this uh, infinite diffusivity ratio would be to add this phi in this next to the diffusivity. Um, that is, the effective diffusivity now becomes d times phi. In phase one, when the volume fraction is one, the diffusivity is d. And in phase two, when the vo volume fraction goes to zero, diffusivity is zero. This would be a naive approach to model this. And we call this, we also call this as previous approach in the future slides. Let's look at how this model performs in a simplest setting say a stationary drop with a uniform, initially uniform scalar concentration field. Because of initial, initially uniform scalar, transport, uh, scalar concentration field and stationary drop, nothing should change with time. But we found that with this model, we see large amounts of artificial numerical leakage at the interface. So, so therefore, the objectives uh, for this part of the talk are we, we need to uh, develop a model that prevents art this artificial numerical leakage. and and the scalar should maintain positivity of the scalar concentration field, which is a realizability condition. And the scalar should be uh, transported consistently with the underlying volume fraction equation. And, it, and all these properties should be maintained even in complex flow regimes. So with this uh, goal, we, we have proposed this uh, model for scalar uh, transport in two phase flows. We can see that the proposed model is also in conservative form. And the proposed fix here, the artificial term is added in such a way that it mimics the evolution of the volume fraction. We can look at some of the consistency conditions that this proposed uh, model satisfies. First one is away from the interface, this model uh, reduces to the generic transport equation. Therefore, there are no uh, spurious effects away from the interface. Another, another consistency condition this satisfies is that in the limit of equilibrium, we can see that the scalar concentration also satisfies the same hyperbolic tangent function. And this is consistent with the underlying uh, equilibrium solution of the volume fraction equation, which is also a hyperbolic tangent function. And the third uh, criterion that we derived is that with the use of this uh, proposed scalar transport model, the positivity of the scalar is always guaranteed, provided we maintain this condition. This is cell Peclet number less than or equal to 1. So if we satisfy this condition, then the scalar uh, concentration is guaranteed to remain positive throughout the simulation. Let's look at a simple test case here. Here we have a moving bubble in a periodic channel. Uh, it's a 2D setup. Uh, the diffusivity of the scalar in the gas phase or inside the bubble is 0. 
and the diffusivity is finite outside in the liquid region. Therefore, the scalar should be con confined to the surrounding medium throughout the simulation. So the results in, uh, that are on the top are from the previous approach or the naive approach. We can see that the previous approach results in significant leakage inside the drop. And the white line here uh, represents the interface. The, the results that are shown on the bottom here are from our proposed model. You can see that there is no leakage uh, and this significantly improves the robustness and accuracy uh, in modeling scalar transport in two-phase flows. So next, uh, if I now plot the scalar concentration field along these uh, lines, we can see the, so the red dashed line is the volume fraction, which represents the bubble. But the blue line is the scalar concentration field from the previous approach. And the black line is the scalar, scalar concentration, sorry, scalar concentration field from the proposed method. We can see that the previous approach not only results in leakage, but also in negative values. Um, negative values, which, is, uh, which results in robustness issues. And the proposed model, we can see that it does not violate the positivity or uh, it does not result in any leakage. So finally, we look at a more complex test case of a scalar in a droplet latent turbulent channel flow. Here, the Reynolds number is uh, no, 150, and the Weber number is oh, oops, sorry. Yeah, the Weber number is one, and we start with uh, 100 drop, 100 droplets. The diffusivity of initially the scalar is confined to the uh, the surrounding medium, and the diffusivity of the the surrounding medium is finite. Oops, why is it going? Okay, sorry. So the diffusivity of the uh, scalar is finite in the surrounding medium, and the diffusivity is, is zero inside the droplet medium, and therefore the Sch Schmidt number is infinite inside the droplet medium. So this is a snapshot from a later time. We can see that scalar remains confined inside uh, to the surrounding medium even after uh, the droplet undergoes complex breakup and, and collisions. And yeah, we also verified that the positive of the scalar concentration is maintained uh, throughout the simulation. And since this is just a passive scalar, there was no effect on the background flow. But in the future, we can couple this scalar to the background flow uh, for the simulation of active scalars. So with this, I would like to uh, conclude by saying that we developed uh, a novel diffusion phase model for compressible two-phase flows. The model is conservative, consistent, and accurate. And we show that the model scales well and is easy to implement because it's, of, because it's a PDE-based model. And the model maintains constant, we showed that the model maintains constant interface thickness throughout the simulation. We showed that the model is also stable for simulating high Reynolds number flows because of the kinetic energy and entropy preserving property. We also looked at the simulation of a droplet-laden compressible isotropic turbulence and looked at the effect of density ratio on the, on the flow. Next, uh, I showed the development of a scalar transport model for two-phase flows. The model maintains positivity of the scalar concentration consistently transports. The scalar concentration field with the volume fraction also prevents any artificial uh, leakage uh, uh, at the interface. And we verified the applicability of the model for wide range of flows, including electrokinetics that I did not show today. I'm open to questions. Yeah, thank you. That's right. Uh, can this uh, be extended uh, to like more than two uh, phases? Yeah, this can be extended for more than two phases. And there are, I think, methods in the literature that already look at this for more than uh, two phases. And yeah, if you have more than, say, let's say you have solid, then you'll have to uh, account for how you are going to model the contact line. But I think, yeah, this has been already done before.
with different, say, with different form of phase field methods. But uh, yes, this has been done before. So we haven't made any direct comparison with the Canhilliard uh, equations, but I know the Canhilliard equations, they use fourth order derivatives. Uh, and that makes it challenging for uh, like for the development of like accurate numerical methods. So yeah, we didn't really uh, use it because of this known challenge that it has fourth order derivatives in the PD. Yeah. So are you asking? Uh, That's right. Uh huh. So the velocity of the e of each species is same as the mixture velocity. So if you think about a diffuse interface method, you have uh, like at the interface, you have volume fraction of one phase slowly going to zero and the volume fraction of other phase goes to one. But the velocity is common for the mixture at the interface, which is the bulk velocity or like the bulk velocity, which is what you just said. So if you can show that the using this velocity, the total kinetic energy of the system is conserved, then that is what I was trying to show. But uh, I, yeah, I don't think I completely understood the, like, say, the second part of your question. What, what do you mean? Uh. Uh, okay, so I think you answered Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Right, that's right. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah, that is because uh, that we think it is because uh, let's see. So we are trying to take uh, the gradients on a field. Let me go back to that. So, so yeah, phi is uh, like a hyperbolic tangent function. Phi assumes uh, a hyperbolic tangent function. Therefore, there is some, although it's not sharp, exactly sharp, there is some sort of discontinuity. It goes from 0 to 1 at the interface. So if you take uh, gradients of that discontinuous field, it results in uh, errors. But here, psi is assigned. So we use a nonlinear transformation going from phi to psi. And psi is a sign distance function. Psi is just a straight line. It is 0 at the interface, and it increases uh, linearly away from the interface on both sides of the interface. And therefore, if you take gradients on that, it uh, results in significantly more accurate uh, representation of, say, normal in this case. And also, this not because of a nonlinear term, uh, if you discretize this nonlinear term that has jumps in phi, this results in errors, which can be uh, reduced using this this sort of nonlinear term. Again, using a sign distance function psi. Psi you can think of psi as a level set function. It's exactly like a level set function. We are proposing a transformation from phi to psi, basically. In this problem, just a follow up to Professor Yakarino's uh, question, I would imagine surface tension would want to keep the shape circular. So do you want to elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, I think um, maybe adding surface tension effects would also reduce some of the interface distortion that you see with this model. Uh, I think that is what is. So are you saying in the test cases that were shown, you did not have surface tension? 
Uh, yeah, so there was no surface tension in any of the test cases that I showed. But yeah, this uh, discrete representation of this nonlinear term instead of this, and discrete representation of this normal instead of this results in significantly more accurate uh, interface shape. And also, we can we can sort of theoretically prove that uh, interface result uh, interface can be much sharper with this method compared to this method. Uh -huh. So let's say you want to apply this, this same procedure in the context of LES. Um, would filtering those consistency terms be used more terms that are so consistent, or are the terms that come out inconsistent? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would imagine if you filter those terms, then you would have to account for more terms. I mean, so you would have to account for, uh, I mean, that will arise to a new closure problem. You'll have to account for that, I think. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I mean, there are some, I know people have looked at this uh, closure problem in term, in using volume of fluid methods. Um, I, I remember a work by Tautan, uh, I think, but I, I don't know if anyone who did this with face field, or, or maybe I don't know about the literature, yeah. Right. Uh, so, but if you if you were to switch to like a high order window scheme or a Gino scheme, do you think both the right hand side would be required anymore, or would it help doing like the streaming parameters closer or similar? Yeah, that's a good another good question. Uh, so I have seen people use just the baseline five equation model that is without any right hand side for all the equations, and they've used Vino, Tino, and all kinds of high order schemes. Uh, I mean, yeah, it results in sharper interface uh, and it works okay, but I know that it will definitely result in some robustness issue when we go to high Mach number applications.